anyway, I let him come, I stop and I let him come over and he comes over close to me and he goes, you, 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 ha, 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 terrorist, terrorist, FBI, ha, 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 I go. Wow. And that was it. Like, that was my first terrorist joke. And my first terrorist joke was mimed to me by somebody I knew really well. <laughs> Didn't think much about it at first, but as I sort of got into the car, I start thinking about it. Um, I go quiet, my brother gets in the car, we drive. I keep thinking about it the whole time. By nighttime, when I came back home, I was seething. I, it just really bothered me. Welcome back to Puckcord. My name is Habib. Today's episode is part one of a two-part series with Ali I. Rizvi, who is 37 years old from Washington, D.C., U.S., but was born in Pakistan. Ali is a documentary filmmaker and a video journalist. He was also one of the few journalists who worked on the Panama Papers story. Ali is also an open ex-Muslim and an atheist, originally born as a Shia Muslim. In this first part of the series, we talk to Ali about his life story and how he became the person he is today. He especially discusses how 9-11 impacted everyday Muslims and Pakistanis like him, especially those living in America and the West, and how the years after 9-11 instigated a search for identity afterwards, including in him. For the first several minutes, Ali will talk about his early years living in America, and then about 10 minutes into this episode, he will begin discussing 9-11. In part two of this series, we ask Ali more specific questions about atheism and how he manages his lifestyle with his family and friends, etc. One last thing I'd like to emphasize here, before we start, is that this episode is not a promotion or an advertisement for atheism. Rather, it's a topic that is worth discussing as atheism is a rising trend among Pakistanis and Muslims today, both within and outside of Pakistan. And this is especially notable on the internet. Ali is just one such example of this. It's a topic that well deserves contemplation, discussion from all thinking Muslims. So for the first several minutes, Ali will talk about his early years living in America, and then about five minutes in, he will begin discussing 9-11 and walk us through his life. Okay, well, my name is Ali I Rizvi. The I is important because uh, I am of Shia background and there's like 50,000 Ali Rizvi's. So this is how I am unique, Ali I Rizvi. So, uh, so if you Google me, you can find me by Ali I Rizvi. Anyway. What does the I stand for? Iftikhar. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't actually say the word iftikhar out loud. I just say I. It sounds cooler. Yeah. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> I, hear you. Uh, I was born uh, in Karachi. I was raised in Islamabad. Mm -hmm. uh, we're three brothers uh, born to what we call Urdu-speaking parents of sort of mainstream Shia Muslim background, aka Mahajir. Mm -hmm background in Pakistan. Mahajir, as you might know, or you may not know, uh, are people who, I do know, yeah. Yeah, who migrated over from like what, what is present day India. Uh, so my parents, they were both civil servants working in Islamabad. Uh, my dad was a geologist. Uh, my mother was a physical therapist. Both worked for the government until one day at an opportune time, we were offered a visa to immigrate to the United States. I was 14 and it was 1996. I want to say. So I learned, you know, it's funny now that I think about it, I learned more about why we really moved later in life, which in part is something that still sort of often motivates me to speak out and, and talk about like identity issues and things like that, of Pakistanis and things like that. Um, we can get to that later. So the year was 1996 and we moved to the States. We initially, I think, moved to Idaho for a few months. And what a place, man. Uh, basically, if you've seen the movie wow. Napoleon Dynamite, that's literally what my life was like for three months. Really? <laughs> that's so interesting. I've never heard of a Pakistani moving to Idaho. This is the first time I'm hearing that. Actually, I don't know a lot of people from Idaho. It's white as hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then we ended up moving to Houston because you know, Idaho is a small state, not a lot of people. And Houston was mm. sort of an obvious place to move given sort of the grown, growing diaspora and a very special type of like diaspora that existed here. Not only because of yeah. the most Muslim diaspora, although there, were like, there was like a sizable Muslim population in Houston, not just the South Asian diaspora, there was a huge contingent of brown folks there. Not even only because there was a mm -hmm. Pakistani diaspora in Houston, though the city was like sort of teeming with Pakistanis, uh, but because of an Urdu speaking Pakistani origin diaspora, centered around Karachi, 
Um, that's, I think that's why my parents felt comfortable moving to Houston. Uh, I later found mm. out that Houston was by far, and still is, to m in my personal opinion, the most Pakistani city in my experience. Uh, and its mm -hmm. Pakistani populace has evolved slightly differently from other cities in, the U in North America. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, I had, I want to say I had a normal upbringing. We assimilated pretty well, my brothers and I. We spoke Urdu outside in a lot of places. Uh, as opposed to like Punjabi or Hindi or Sindhi, whatever. Uh, yeah. And we had a group of sort of diverse friends in the in the hood that we lived in. We lived in a low income sort of area. In Houston. In Houston, yeah. I went to okay. like an Islamic Sunday school on Sundays. And then yeah. basically the rest of my evenings I spent playing basketball in the hood and learning basketball. It was typical. Like you, you ever seen a Spike Lee joint where there's a green colored hood and there's like all these ballers coming out and playing basketball? That's that's what my <laughs> that's what my hood was like. Yeah. Were you living close to the Sugarland area? Yeah. So there's a there's a enclave. I think it's part of Houston now. Uh, the city called A Leaf, yeah. Texas, and A Leaf was in the middle of Sugarland in Houston, and it was like where a lot of sort of brown people get their start to this day. I think still, it's an epicenter right. of sorts. But it's also mm -hmm. like, you know, it used to be very very ghetto. I haven't been back mm -hmm. in a while, but yeah. Uh, my parents were actually, the reason why we moved there is because my parents, when we moved here, were sort of overqualified for every job they applied for. And they ended up working on like odd jobs. So while we assimilated mm -hmm. pretty well, they, they didn't really do so well. Um, both of my brothers uh, went on to become extremely well-to-do engineers. Um, I was the failure of the family and I gave everyone sort of a collective heart attack when I chose to go to film school for a master's degree. <laughs> Are you the youngest brother? No, I'm the middle guy. And, you know, it's kind of worked out for me. I've worked with, over the years, ESPN, MTV. I've won a couple of Emmys and uh, I was part of a Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize uh, last couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm a filmmaker slash journalist. So I've done a few things in my life and I'm still alive. Yet here mm -hmm. we are talking about identity. And, and issues regarding right. ourselves. So, yeah. How did you end up moving to, I, I know you didn't get to this part yet, but uh, you're in DC right now, or the DC area. How did that happen? Yeah, so basically after I got out of film school, I was working with ESPN in Connecticut. I moved to MTV in New York City right after that because mm -hmm. there's nothing in Connecticut, really. It's like worse than Idaho. You were in Bristol, right? Yeah. In the yeah. middle of nowhere. I used, to, I used to live really close to there. Oh, God. I'm sorry to hear that. I, I, I grew up in Connecticut most of my life. I, I honestly hated Connecticut. <laughs> so I, I ended up moving yeah. to New York City. Uh, I was working with a sort of small division of MTV that actually did music-related content, uh, which never made air. It's really weird. So, and, and I, incidentally, I worked with a, uh, a division of MTV called MTV World, uh, which uh, owned the MTV Desi franchise, which we, which I was a producer at. So I got to know a lot of sort of, you know, Pakistani sort of indie artists mm -hmm. because I was helping promote them here in North America and things like that. Uh, I got sort of re in touch with my roots. And of course, uh, mm -hmm. MTV stopped funding uh, MTV World, uh, a division that actually made music related content. So yeah, and then my wife actually, she ended up going to law school in uh, DC. And I was like, sure, I'll move there. Of course, all the jobs in D.C. are related to media. So I took up a job with a company called McClatchy. Um, not okay. a lot of people know about it, but basically it's a company that owns 30 newspapers in the United States. Really? And uh, my job was mm -hmm. like a filmmaker. I was like an in-house sort of a video resource for any of the 30 newspapers that were doing any big project. So mm -hmm. like the Miami Herald was doing, just happened to be doing like a secret project called Panama Papers. And they right. roped, roped me into that, and that's I was I was involved there. I was one of the eight journalists that broke the story. Really? Okay. And I should have uh, watched out for your name on the on the news when that happened. There's not a lot of focus on the people who who work behind the scenes on this type of stuff, right? Amazing to learn that uh, you were involved in that. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I, I get I get emails once in a while. Some of them are hate mails. <laughs> Some of them are like <laughs> thank you emails, the random yeah. ones. I don't know how they find my email address, but uh, it's it's rewarding. <laughs> Then 9-11 happened one day. 9-11 happened. You were you were actually in Houston at that time. Yeah, I was. I was. Yeah, where were you on that day? I guess just walk us through what happened. Yeah. Uh, well, let me set the stage for a second. So I mentioned I lived in the hood, right? And 
Mm -hmm. We lived in a low-income neighborhood. Uh, it was a traditional hood in many, many ways. You know, there there were liquor shops and gun shops everywhere. Uh, yeah, yeah. There were basketball courts. Uh, cops typically kept to themselves, and you know, and it was a rough place. But if you lived in that neighborhood, uh, you were okay. You were part of a community that was sort of safe and sort of insulated. Uh, you know, my neighbors didn't really speak English that well. Sometimes, you know, our, our Mexican neighbors would bring in like tamales, you know, like they knew we didn't eat halal meat. We didn't eat like non-halal meat, so they would give us like uh, vegetarian food sometimes. And and I had friends from all over the place, you know, different like you know, African-American friends and, and a lot of Hispanic friends and obviously Pakistani origin and Muslim friends and, and uh, Indian friends. All lived in that neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, sort of got along even though no one really spoke to each other, you know, verbally. They just mm -hmm. couldn't communicate. It was just a thing. So that that's the mm -hmm. type of place I lived in. So yeah, and it was a crisp day. I remember that because Houston is a warm place. It's not very cold. And when it is nice yeah. and fresh, you'd remember those days. Those are good memories typically. Right. I woke up that morning. Um, I, my older brother was late getting up and we both were like drive to the university together. I wake up earlier, I have breakfast, I'm sitting in the living room, I open the television and, and there you have it. You know, the thing happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it was the first tower that got hit and it was on TV and I was watching it and I was kind of like, I wasn't sure what was going on. I thought, okay, maybe a building's on fire. In New York City, it's really far. It's like almost to Canada or something. I don't have anything to do with it. Right. right. Whatever. Yeah. 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 And you were about 20 years old, right? Uh, yeah, I want to say maybe yeah. 18. I want to say I was 18 or something like that. Yeah. So my brother takes forever uh, getting ready. By the time he gets ready, mm -hmm. the second tower, you know, has come down. And uh, I was like, what is going on? Um, mm -hmm. uh, my brother starts having breakfast at this point, And I open the front door. And I want to go into the car to, like, just, just warm it up. I'm walking outside and the superintendent of our apartment building where we lived uh, was this, uh, I think, Mexican guy. I don't remember his name, sadly, but uh, he never spoke any English. And, you know, every time we had a problem in our apartment, he would come in, fix it. We would like verbally say thank you. And he would say the same thing and he'll walk away. That morning, he sort of waves me down as I was walking to my car and he comes over. <laughs> And he basically starts miming something to me. And he's like almost laughing. And it's a very funny thing to him. Anyway, I let him come. I stop and I let him come over. And he comes over close to me and he goes, he basically mimes, you, 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 ha, 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 terrorist, terrorist, FBI, ha, 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 I go. Wow. And that was it. Like, that was my first terrorist joke. And my first terrorist joke was mimed to me by somebody I knew really well. <laughs> I thought it was kind of hilarious because at the moment it was like, okay, that's pretty clownish, whatever. At that time, the news were still developing, so probably you didn't know that Muslims were involved or anything like that. Anything yeah, like that. yeah, I, I didn't. Yeah, I mean, there was none of that. Was you know, it was just something that happened some faraway place. But this guy made the connection, you know, mm -hmm. without knowing anything about the city he lived in, about the country he lived in. As far as he was concerned, he, this guy doesn't speak English. He only like sits and eats and like. Uh, his Hispanic community and doesn't have any contact from the outside world because he was illegal. Yet here he is approaching me with something that I will be and a lot of us will be pummeled with over the next 20 years. You know? <laughs> um, so it's, it's funny how quickly that developed. Didn't think much about it at first, but as I sort of got into the car, I start thinking about it. Um, I go quiet, my brother gets in the car, we drive. I keep thinking about it the whole time. In the background, my brother turns the radio on. He's listening to like the commentary of what's going on with the 9-11 stuff because every radio station was sort of talking about it. I was not thinking about it. I was thinking about what this guy was talking about to me. Like, you know, his, this, this superintendent that sort of mimed this terrorist joke. And as I got to my destination at the university, I got really angry. I was like, wait a minute. This guy just told me that I'm the one sort of responsible for something that happened. It just sort of started clicking in. Mm-hmm. By nighttime, when I came back home, I was seething. I, it just really bothered me, you know? Now, let's not forget, there's right. other things that are happening on TV at this point. The towers have come down, so many people have died, it's kind of tragic, you know, and so forth. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, the world is reacting. And I'm thinking about this guy, one-to-one. The next morning, I'm so mad that I basically pick up the phone. I call the INS, which is now rebranded to the Homeland Security uh, Division of the United States. It used to be called INS right. uh, International. At that time. Yeah. I called him up. I was like, you know what? I think uh, there is an illegal person working in our uh, building. I'm not comfortable with this person. Can you please check this out? I basically left an anonymous tip and that was it. Mm-hmm. Um, I never I never saw our superintendent after that ever again. Like, I don't know what happened. And that was such a terrible thing I did. Like, I still think about it mm-hmm. to this day. Like, when my son grows up, he's a baby right now, he's eight months old. I'm gonna make sure he never does anything like that. I'm gonna make sure he knows this story. And if he ever thinks about it, think twice before doing anything like that. Especially taking action in the heat of the moment. That's that's basically what you did, right? You were kind of angry in the moment and the news was still developing. So obviously there was a mix of emotions. Yeah. But mm-hmm. it's also a little hard to interpret what he did, which was, uh, it, it's, it's kind of difficult to see that, but uh, I know exactly what you're talking about because to some extent I experienced that as well where people would laugh about something so serious, like 9-11 when it happened, but they would kind of pin blame on you at the same time. So it was almost like an angry, but anger and amusement. That, that, at least that, that's how I perceived it from their side, from a lot of the racism that I got. And it's just so hard to process it, right? Because anger and amusement are two completely opposite emotions, typically. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, how do you respond to that? We're not trained for that. I certainly wasn't. Of course, yeah. You know? Well, you you were at least 18, 19. I was 11. So what I felt was a lot more immature, you know, for my peers in middle school at that time. I was... Uh, oh, I was just as immature. Trust me. But... <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's also because at that age, at age 11, I barely even knew what I was. How would I know what somebody else did? While we were in school, what they did was the tower, the first tower was struck, say, I think 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, something in the morning. And uh, the teacher is just put on the TV. So we just watched TV all day, pretty much. We didn't really even uh, have classes. You know, like, again, we were just kids. And I went to a really bad school neighborhood, uh, very similar to what you're describing. You know, very ghetto, very high immigrant population, very mixed, very diverse, and uh, a little high on poverty. So, you know, it, it was kind of odd because I never expected racism in that type of community where you have so much diversity already. And then ironically, most of the racism that I got was throughout my life, not just in, in that area, but throughout my life, most of the racism I've gotten is from other minorities. So it's it's just so hard to process that because you, you often think we're all in this together or you think you're sharing a side with somebody. I'm sure you face similar types of challenges, but growing up here is already challenging enough when you're when you're an immigrant. But then on top of that, when something like this happened after 9-11, my life did change from what it could have been without 9-11 ever happening. This is a personal opinion, of course. Like a lot of communities, like minority communities, especially in the, in the U.S. and maybe the West, they sort of regressed within themselves and became sort of insular and hard where anybody outside of it was essentially like an enemy. So if you were from like the, like the Hispanic community, you know, you, you were tight and, you know, every, and this was your moment to like uh, take the shine, like the light shining on from away, away from you and maybe point to somebody else. Like, Hey, that's the bad guy. Let's, let's, uh, you know, let's not talk about me. Let's, Maybe, you know, let's make fun of this person, you know. I think, I feel like that, a lot of that happened. Yeah. And, you know, similar to what you described, your experience with the super, the superintendent, in school on that day, 9-11, the first few memories that I have of other people was my, uh, my peers over there just kind of laughing about it. And you know how kids are. They were just, they thought it was kind of like a movie. They saw the plane hitting the the tower and they were just like damn you you know those types of reactions whoa and i i've often been the quiet shy kid growing up and uh you know i would take things very seriously so even at age 11 i kind of knew that uh, something awful had gone down age 12 actually something awful had just happened i I knew like you know right off the bat they mentioned real you know almost three thousand people have died and so the seriousness of this was was uh like i was getting offended at these kids that uh, they were making such a, a light humor out of it. And yet, 
on that same day, later that afternoon, I guess the news kind of developed that uh, this guy, Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and all this stuff, right? And uh, people started asking me, are you Muslim? And, you know, as soon as I said, in the cafeteria, I said, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, I'm Muslim. And these girls just kind of had held their hands to their mouth and just walked away. So you could you could imagine the confusion in my mind at that time, because I didn't even know what it meant to be like Muslim at that moment, or that there is such a thing as Islamic extremism and, you know, all these other things that I had to learn later on in life. Yeah. Well, here, can I just digress here for just a moment? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Go. So, you know, you're talking about what it meant to be Muslim and Islamic extremism. Uh, so somebody from, from my background, you know, uh, from like a Shia background, like 12 or main, mm -hmm. mainstream Shia background. Um, so I was very aware of this. And in fact, one of the reasons we moved from Pakistan was because, you know, my 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 parents were constantly just sort of threatened uh, by mm -hmm. sort of extremists in Pakistan because they held mm -hmm. sort of like these like prestigious positions. And we have, you know, certain type of last names. Uh, we were very easy targets. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I said, you know, it was an opportune time for us to immigrate. And, you know, we did we just did. Uh, we, I later learned that, you know, uh, from my dad, that uh, one day a man came into his office, very polite. Urdu mein baat kar banda. He gave him a piece of paper. Ye ek piece of paper hai. Aap isko kholiyega jab main chala jaun. Theek hai. Shukriya. Salam dua karke chala gaya. Chala gaya. My father, you know, uh, he opened the piece of paper, and it basically had the names of my brothers, full names, all you know, all our background information, including. Uh, my mom's name and, and my dad's name. Basically, it was written that we are on a list, a uh, target list. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, if my dad didn't quit his job, you know, we are going to go to jam. You know what will happen. Basically, that's what, that's what the deal was. So we were on like a targeted killing list. We hear about like targeted assassinations of you know Shia people in, in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. But who, who was maintaining this list again? Was it the government no. or who, who was this? That's the thing. I mean, it was sort of extremist, um, like Sunni groups, like that sort of ran yeah. rampant in Pakistan. I don't mm -hmm. know what the, because the names change so often because they get banned every time they come out. I mean, this is in the 80s, I'm guessing, right? This was in the 90s, in 96 ki baat. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but like they don't exist anymore in that form anyway. But Sipa Sahaba was like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, was the group and they basically terrorized religious minorities in Pakistan of, of Muslim origin. So like, you know, anybody who wasn't like mainstream Sunni was basically not Muslim and they didn't have a right to a lot of things in Pakistan, according to these people anyway. Um, which is ironic because yeah. the Muslim extremists were actually against the creation of Pakistan. They sort of like, you know, the Theobandis and like, uh, like basically a lot of different like uh, people of orthodoxy, Sunni orthodoxy were mm -hmm. absolutely against the creation of Pakistan uh, for reasons yeah. that is another podcast altogether. But it's ironic that they now sort of like have such a sway in Pakistani politics. Uh, it peaked out in the 90s right. where sort of they were basically doing this openly and terrorizing. You know, bombs would go off mm -hmm. in Shia masjids and processions all the time. Mm -hmm. So I was very, all mm -hmm. this to say that I was very, very aware of like extremism among the Muslim community. Yes. So it was, I think, Part of the anger that came that day uh, when I reported that Hispanic guy was like, he was now grouping me with the people that were sort of persecuting me in the first place. You know, right. this is before mm -hmm. Bush started his wars and everything. I was like, you know, he doesn't know anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's a double whammy for you. You basically grew up as a minority within a minority. Right. In the U.S. And uh, that, that's such a complicated position to be in because you can get confused for various different types of people when you're not. Yeah, yeah. Even in Pakistan, people tend to think that uh, the country is so homogenous just because it's predominantly Muslim, right? It's about like 95% Muslim or so on paper. But that 95% breaks down into so many different sects and segments of Muslims. I think I read that about 80% of them were Sunni. Yeah, it's, it's over, over, it was dominantly Sunni, uh, you know, mainstream Sunni yeah. anyway. You know, there's other deviations from Sunnis too. But and then within Sunni, yeah, there's uh, the Bredvis and, you know, the Obandis, like you kind of mentioned. There's a lot of complication there. It's not just uh, simple enough to call yourself Sunni nowadays. Yeah, yeah. So here's, here's a dilemma too. Like, you know, when, 
when we talked about how communities regressed, just say Hamlogi communities, you know, they've sort of took a step back and basically hardened mm -hmm. and got together. We're like, okay, we need to defend ourselves. We need to sort of, and how do we do that? We, we follow like uh, the train of thought that we've sort of hoped to, you know, follow, which is Islam. So we are Muslim, we are like, you know, uh, and that's, that's, that's our thing. But what is Muslim? Like, you know, that's another thing. Uh, I remember like the Muslim student associations um, after 9-11, they were like in a huge flux because, okay, uh, now that the spotlight is on us, right? Uh, the mm -hmm. onus is on us to like, it's upon us to like tell people we're Muslim. Okay, let's, let's go to the MSA meeting. Uh, turns out uh, that's not easy to do. What is Muslim defining Muslim, you know? Is it, is it uh, do we sort of pray in front of everybody as an MSA in the form of like, you know, how the Sunnis pray with their hands closed? Do we, do we pray behind a Shia person? Were Amudi people involved? Mm -hmm. Were Ismailis now part of the MSA? You know what I'm saying? So like, like that alone was like a huge deal. Like <laughs> there was a lot of extremism in the MSAs at that point because a, a lot of the money that came from, for the MSAs back then was from like Saudi Arabia. Like it just was. And yeah. the people that were in charge of the MSAs obviously uh, didn't like uh, the fact that all these other people of Muslim backgrounds who call themselves Muslims um, mm -hmm. were now part of the MSA. So now you have like uh, Shia Muslim associations. Now you have Ahmadi Muslim associations. Now you have like all these other type of different associations that didn't quite yeah. exist 20 years ago. This is a relatively mm -hmm. new phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. And it continues to this day. You know, uh, it's like you said, it's not simple enough to call yourself Muslim anymore. It's never been for, for hundreds of years. We've been kind of ha having these uh, these divisions within divisions. It's almost like, uh, I, I guess it's just a natural human tendency. I kind of arrived at that conclusion that people kind of like to deviate into smaller groups once a group gets to way too big. It's primal. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. It's just, a, it's just part of our nature. It's human nature. Uh, to segue into something else. Uh, something related. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my parents were sort of like moderate people. My mom never covered her hair. My father was sort of like, you know, almost agnostic mm -hmm. without saying it. He was all his life. Just culturally Muslim. But after this whole spiel, they needed to find a community because remember, uh, my parents never were able to fit in properly. And the only place they could was at the mosque. Mostly mm -hmm. because there's no Pakistani community um, a viable Pakistani community that could come to a consensus as to what they are. So they just went to their Shia mosque and like they became like proper like Shia Muslims. My mom started covering her hair, uh, you know, hijab, panelagi. My father became religious, started praying. I personally thought that was sort of shocking, you know. Not that they didn't mm -hmm. pray before, not that my mom didn't cover her hair, masjid jati thing. But like, Full time, matlab, you know, <laughs> full time uh, Muslim one ban gaya and and that's mm -hmm. fine. Right, right. But that made me wonder, like, how fragile is our sort of idea of like uh, of religion, of identity, if that's all it takes. Mm -hmm. And then you know their their views became regressive too. Like you know, uh, ha, just say you know, Ahmadi and Muslim nahi hote, Sunniyon se duro, they're not good people in general. You know, saying the same things that mm -hmm. they were sort of last with all their lives they were saying the same things because they are now part of this regressive group that wanted to protect itself yeah, yeah. right that was a turn off for me because i feel like i came to the us at a really good time where i was sort of coming of age so i was in the middle of it you know i could understand both cultures and i could understand like and i had friends that were like non shia they were sunni friends i had hindu friends here at catholic mormon Mormon friends in Idaho, yeah. I had Ismaili friends in Houston, huge community of Ismailis in Houston. So I grew up with like, I feel like a lot of, lot of religions. And I feel like right. if you grow up with a lot, a lot of religions, you're done with religion pretty quickly. If you grow up with one religion, you're stuck with it for life. That's sort of how I see things. Hmm. So to, to make the long story short, and what sealed the deal for me one time was, you know, I was looking for some logic and some sense of this whole situation. I once went to a, accidentally went to a Neil deGrasse Tyson, he's a lecture physician, uh, astrophysicist. Yeah, 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 I watch his videos a lot. Yeah, but back then he wasn't very famous, but he was sort of a lecturer. Uh, I went to a lecture mm -hmm. of his and there was um, 
it was pretty interesting i was into sci-fi so i thought you know interesting cheez bata raha banda let's go check it out so <laughs> in the middle of his lecture on science and like uh, biology ek uh, sort of extremist christian banda uth ke khada hota hai kehta hai he just interrupts like the lecture rudely <laughs> and he goes sir you don't know everything and if you do know everything why don't you explain this question to me i'm a christian i have certain beliefs which i know are true but how do you explain what happens to us when we die can you explain that sir and i will never forget this he what he said after this neil degrasse tyson he basically said okay thank you for your time and we know what happens when we die the flora and fauna mm-hmm. of this world will eat you and dine upon you as you have dined upon it while you were alive that's all we know that happens everything else is conjecture and that type of rational thought i i was blown away by it i was like okay this is pretty respectful mm-hmm. but he basically annihilated my personal beliefs uh this there's something yeah. to it that was mm-hmm. the trigger i would say that you know <laughs> that that kind of triggered that thought and the exploration of uh, religion and so i'm assuming you did a lot of research on islam too Yes, there there was a moment in my life where I did a lot of research on Islam, try to figure out where things are, you know, how things fit in. Right, right. Here's where it gets complicated. So, I realized when I stepped back from a religion for a little bit, I was still Muslim, you know, at this point. Not hardcore, sorry, moderate. Like I would still go pray once in a while and, you know, do the things Muslims do. Muslim things, you know. Mm-hmm. Hashtag. Uh Yeah. <laughs> so basically, I realized that in the middle of all this in the late 2000s, my identity was again being attacked and this time it was a pakistani identity mm-hmm. because that was a scapegoat everything bad that happened in the mm-hmm. world pakistan was behind it there has to be a way and it was on the news channels obama was talking about it there were drone strikes yeah. that had started on the on the daily um right. even muslims were talking about it so here's here's here we have the same thing at this point mm-hmm. muslims are like now compact in their communities and they want to take the spotlight away from them you know you sit with your muslim friends you know uh arab friends or persian friends they will make fun of pakistan back then like oh yeah oh oh yeah pakistan's like the little bitch of yeah. uh, pretty much all the middle east and uh, you know that's actually very true i was i was just thinking about this the other day everybody hates us afghanistan hates us too right, you know, right. all these other muslim countries we call they consider friends right right and and you know oh, some of them God. might have some legitimate grievances that's fine of course yeah i'm sure they do that's the thing but you were born into it so there's a conflict there that you didn't get to choose to be pakistani right and the conflict is not that i don't like being pakistani i love being pakistani but rather that in certain situations i'm expected to represent or justify all of pakistan's mistakes violations issues whatever and that's not something i can do i'm just a guy a pakistani guy i cannot answer everything You and I both will forever have this identity attached to our names. Yeah. Forever. No matter what we do, no matter how sort of whitewash we be, if we ever become Bobby Jindals of our time, we will still have that uh identity sort of attached to us. It will never go away. Uh yeah. Yeah. and that yeah. made me angry. I was like, why are Muslim people sort of like just picking this identity of mine and making fun of it and like just throwing it in the trash and like using and it's and it you know it was it was very loaded at that time and i i was really upset about it yeah that made me wonder like you know maybe i should do something about that maybe i should get people to talk about this identity and protect it and you know it's a muslim country blah 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 and i tried for years and no one cared like like it was just never a thing so every time i go go to the mosque uh i would ask like the uh the imams and the mullahs be like hey can we also pray for pakistan or something a kashmir and this and that and no one ever talked about kashmir or anything or pakistan in general they were like oh yeah a palestine no you know a muslim umma in palestine uh, they would pray for it and i would just get angry and angry and angry and angry and then i realized you know uh it's true like you know after sort of this 911 world that we live in muslims and people of sort of muslim origin were cornered into options you know after that bush speech you know you were with us or without us either you're part of like the west or you or you're muslim uh and there's no middle there and there's no pakistan mm-hmm. in the middle there's no room for pakistani identities it just disappears mm-hmm. you know i had various thoughts in my mind too while you were while you were speaking here about the pakistani identity 
You're absolutely right. When you get put into this this situation, which is you were born as a Pakistani person, right? Every time Pakistan gets attacked, you're automatically on the defense. <laughs> and that's what I found about myself. And honestly, it's a very place to be from my perspective it's you know it's like playing a game on super hard mode a video game <laughs> and all the bosses are like super equipped and you got like nothing you got a stick to beat them with because <laughs> oftentimes i found that the the facts lie against us that uh, you know a lot of the complaints that people might have against pakistan are often valid and, and it's hard to fight against them yeah um, they're legit similarly for the muslim world too you know there's a lot of legitimate arguments against uh you could say Islamic culture or or Muslim countries in general. I, you know, even even as a Muslim, I find the argument from the opposite side very interesting. So I actually watch a lot of videos from atheists. Uh, you mentioned uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. That, that's one, right? So in my mind, I, I like to assess what are the good arguments or not. And I like to see how Muslims respond to those. Because if, to me, it's just really interesting in general to kind of study human beings and the, the, the fact that when certain people, when their identity is attacked, their argument becomes more emotional. It becomes yeah. more sentimental. Yes. And that, that often becomes a weakness, I've noticed. So here's a little case in point. I was discussing this with a friend and I had a little argument about family planning. Should we introduce family planning in Pakistan more, you know, aggressively? Get Pakistan mein logo bhi che che sa aat aat bache paida kar without any income and to me that's a huge problem you're bringing life into this world and you don't have the means to support them when i was arguing this with somebody who was you know a bit more religious pakistani his argument was you know <laughs> it, it, it almost boiled down to allah dene wala you know yeah. allah is risk deta hai <laughs> but my approach to this was let's have a more down to earth discussion theek hai allah taala hamari madad karta hai inshallah aage bhi karta rahega lekin hum kya kar rahe hain apne fayde ke liye and uh, you know he tried to come up with all sorts of these uh, economical arguments about why having more kids is good look at india you know your population becomes your workhorse in the economy and uh, you know we were having this back and forth but uh, at the end of the day i just noticed that when somebody's fighting out of a uh, emotional defense that you can't really talk them out of it it's it's kind of hard to reason with them no you're absolutely right because at the end of the day you're it's almost like you're attacking the religion that's not what it is uh, you know for me necessarily either for muslims like me it can be really difficult to have a pragmatic discussion with more religious people i think when you defend yourself from a position of religion right it's it's based on a set of beliefs beliefs are sort of based on faith on something and faith is not fact you're you're arguing with somebody who has like an idea of something and there's no actual proof of this idea and they're leaning on this so you can't it's a fallacy you see you it's you can go around in circles because you can't disprove it you know we're we're we are having this really weird now like metaphysical sort of uh discussion but <laughs> but like that's yeah, the yeah. problem and you know pakistan itself was i i would there's a lot of people that argue including me now that pakistan was formed for a muslim people right it was generally yeah. speaking it was formed as a land for our uh, people of muslim background they never identified mm-hmm. who is muslim yeah is it is it people who believe that uh prophet muhammad was like the last prophet because there's a lot of muslim groups that don't i don't know if you know that but there's a lot of muslim groups not just the amadi folks oh, yeah. um even yeah. amadi folks there there's some factions within them that believe that so like what is islam like mm-hmm. some people there's some um groups in like uh the muslim umbrella under the muslim umbrella that actually believe in like catholic like trinity mm-hmm. uh they believe like like Hazrat Ali and Muhammad Hazrat Muhammad uh, and and Allah were part of this trinity. It was almost like a Catholic like thing. Like you know what I'm saying? So, Do you know the name of that group? I'm going to look them up. Wanna say uh, the Alawites uh jo ke uh Syria mein hai, they're in power right oh, now. Right, or right, or right, Nus- yeah, no no, I think they're actually an off group uh, offshoot of mm-hmm. Alawites called Nusairi. Mm-hmm. Uh if you google Nusairi, yeah. that should come up. And they believe mm-hmm. like Hazrat Adr- Adr- Ali basically Allah came down and and like jesus did in in catholic beliefs that you know in the form of a human and that human was hazrat ali that's why hazrat ali was so powerful just to sort of like show like humanity all the other yes. stuff i don't know the details but my <laughs> point is there's so much such a diverse sort of thought so much uh among yeah. the muslim community that there's no such thing mm-hmm. as like one islam and if there's no such thing as one islam then there's no way you can have an islamic country called Pakistan there's just no way mm-hmm. which islam will you follow mm-hmm. 
लोग बात करते हैं कई बार के यू नो पाकिस्तान में सिर्फ शरीय ही चल सकती है वी नीड शरीय वी नीड शरीय एंड अलॉट ऑफ अदर कंट्रीज कैन ऑफ आर्ग्यू दैट सेम थिंग यू नो वी वर बे आर फाउंडेशन इज इस्लाम वी नीड शरीय एंड ये ईच कंट्रीज कैन ऑफ इंटरप्रटेशन ऑफ शरीय इज सो डिफरेंट मैं मैं एक बात कहूँगा कि पाकिस्तान में जो शरीय है पाकिस्तान पाकिस्तान की आइडेंटिटी दूसरे मुस्लिम कंट्रीज बहुत डिफरेंट है ज़्यादातर मुस्लिम कंट्रीज़ जो हैं वो हमाजनस हैं यू नो जैसे अरब कंट्रीज़ हैं पर्शियन कंट्रीज़ हैं बाजनिया फॉर एग्जांपल बहुत एक तरह की पॉपुलेशन है पाकिस्तान में लाइक like, बहुत डिफरेंट तरह के लोग रहते हैं यू नो मल्टीपल लाइक एथनिक आंकलेवस हैं लिंग्विस्टिक ग्रुप्स हैं रिलीजस कम्यूनिटीज़ हैं एंड कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ ऑल दोज हाउजन्स एंड लाइक यू कैन गो फॉर एग्जाम्पल टू ए सॉर्ट ऑफ सुन्नी सूफी कम्यूनिटी इन इंटरनल सिंध इंटीरियर सिंध इट विल प्रैक्टिस इस्लाम एब्सोलूटली द सेम इस्लाम एब्सोलूटली डिफरेंटली दैट द वंस इन लाइक इन नॉर्दर्न पाकिस्तान आई मीन इट्स वी हैव अ लॉट ऑफ डिवर्सिटी मोर सो दैन अदर कंट्रीज इन द मुस्लिम वर्ल्ड सो टू स्पीक हम लोग की शरीय है इट्स नॉट कम्पेरेबल विद यू नो हम लोग की जो लूज शरीय है इट्स बेस्ड ऑन लूज मेन स्ट्रीम सुन्नी थाट and it just doesn't work it it just doesn't work now imagine this viewpoint of from coming from pakistan pakistani je nazariya imagine mm-hmm. it getting lost in like all this thing what uh, in going on in the world whether uh, you know you're either with us or without us either you're muslim or you're from the west isme kaha matlab pakistan ki baatein karenge kaha kar there's koi jagah hai hi nahi bilkul bhool gaye the hum log you know we the pakistani identity jo bilkul khatam ho gayi thi लोग लोगों ने पाकिस्तान के बारे में बात करना ही छोड़ दी थी सो दैट्स दैट्स द थिंग अ ह्यूज गैप हियर भूल गए थे हम लोग लाइक यू नो ये कॉन्वर्सेशन खत्म हो गई थी यू नो पाकिस्तान यूज टू बी अ वेरी सॉर्ट ऑफ प्रोग्रेसिव कंट्री अप अपिल द एटीज वेन सॉर्ट ऑफ लाइक यू नो जियाउल हक केम एंड ही सॉर्ट ऑफ अमेंडेड द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन विच वॉज नॉट द ग्रेटेस्ट कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन टू बिगिन विद बट लाइक इट इट हैड सम ग्रेट सॉर्ट ऑफ लीवे फॉर लाइक हाउ टू डील विद पीपल हु यू कंसिडर मुस्लिम uh the state had certain rights uh and minorities had a lot of rights and that type of thing um yeah, you know yeah. and and it started getting like uh sort of like scary in the 80s i remember my parents were like super shocked and it wasn't a big mm-hmm. deal to the united states or anywhere else in the world because the you know, pakistan at that point was you know doing like the west dirty work so anything that was going mm-hmm. on all the extremism was pakistan's problem you know hamara koi problem thodi hai hamare yahan kuch ho nahi raha um you know unka kaam chal raha hai chalne do so that's what was happening and then that got out of hand obviously got out of hand you know <laughs> now you have yeah. people who sort of did those things in the past in the 80s and the 90s and now they're in power mm-hmm. some of them might actually run run for office and they're sitting on these pa- positions of power but perpetuating mm-hmm. these things on in in an illegal ways that they can't do anymore you know but they're still doing it So do you do you formally consider yourself atheist or agnostic or how do you define yourself in in that religious aspect I'm pretty outspoken atheist pretty outspoken to my family to people in Pakistan to my family in Pakistan to my friends Well it's well I'll tell you this like my as far as my friends are concerned it's been a very lonely journey like I was abandoned by friends who were you know honestly they were looking for community and I wasn't part of the community right so I was like mm-hmm. I was a kafir mera kafir ban gaya I don't believe in these things that they believe in. But yeah. here's the weird part. I still like when Eid arrives, my wife is still Muslim, right? We'll we'll mm-hmm. still throw an Eid party. Mine my, my party might have alcohol in there. Uh mm-hmm. but it's still culturally relevant to me. You know? So I'm culturally still Muslim. Like I'm not going to go out and develop like new like atheist culture. There's no such thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. And I can give you a good mm-hmm. a good example like when my father passed away 10 years ago. You know and my brothers are almost there too. They're still Muslim but like you know they're teetering. So when my mm-hmm. father passed away, uh we buried him the only way we ever knew how, which was the Shia Muslim way, bring in a mullah, wrap him in, wrap my father in a shroud, put him in, do a namaz, namaz janaza. Yeah. Or that's it. Mm-hmm. Even though it held no religious significance, I wasn't I wasn't I, I wasn't thinking he's going to magically appear when I die in the future. You know, it's, it has no that didn't exist for me the fact that it was just a cultural practice that brought closure to me and i just grew up with it i'm not going to invent new practices now that i don't believe in like the religious form of it 
It doesn't That's offend true. me if you're Muslim, but it shouldn't yeah. offend you either. We both have the right to be offended. Like no one mm-hmm. has died of being offended. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. तो मैं ये समझाने की कोशिश करता हूँ बच्चों को जो मेरे फैमिली में बच्चे हैं और काफ़ी बच्चे हैं जो कन्फ्यूज हैं तो मैं उनको ये समझाने की कोशिश करता हूँ इट्स ओके अगर तुम्हें मुसलमान रहना है बनना है तो यू नो अपने काम से काम रखना सीखो अपने उसमें सलाहियत होनी चाहिए दैट्स द की थिंग वरना यू नो इफ यू वॉन लर्न मोर अबाउट लाइक लिविंग रिलीजन आई बी हैप्पी टू टॉक टू यू अबाउट इट एंड वाई आई एंड वाई आई लेफ्ट रिलीजन एंड हाउ आई लेफ्ट रिलीजन तो इसमें कोई डरने की बात नहीं है नो वन गन किल यू यू नो रियलिस्टिकली स्पीकिंग इन द फ्यूचर दिस विल बी द डोमिनेंट वे ऑफ थिंकिंग लाइक यू नो रैशनल वे ऑफ थिंकिंग देर जस्ट नो वे अदर वे अराउंड इट वी लिव इन अ स्मॉल वर्ल्ड एंड एवरीथिंग अंडर अ स्पॉट लाइट एंड योर कम्यूनिटी दैट्स वेरी एक्सट्रीमिस्ट इट्स गेट स्मॉलर एंड स्मॉलर एंड स्मॉलर देर इज जस्ट नो वे तो यू कैन हैव टू लर्न टू लिव विद अदर पीपल आई ऑफ इन डिस्कस फ्रीडम ऑफ स्पीच इज वेल और मुझे कहीं लोग बताते हैं कि फ्रीडम ऑफ स्पीच यू नो हमारे मुल्क में भी बहुत हैं एंड बाय द वे आई हैव अ लॉट ऑफ इश्यूज़ विद द द अमेरिकन सेंस ऑफ फ्रीडम ऑफ स्पीच टू लाइक देयर इज अ लॉट ऑफ थिंग्स दैट वी कैंट से हियर आइदर दैट वी शुड बी एबल टू इट्स ऑल सब्जेक्टिव ऑनेस्टली एवरी कल्चर हैज इट्स ओन इंटरप्रिटेशन ऑफ व्हाट्स फ्री टू स्पीक बट यू नो जस्ट सेइंग दैट यू आर एथियस्ट इन अ दैट यू कन्वर्टेड आउट ऑफ इस्लाम इन पाकिस्तान कुड कॉज यू अ लॉट ऑफ प्रॉब्लम्स आई एम नॉट श्योर इफ देयर इज एनी एग्जैक्ट लॉ दैट counts it as a apostasy type criminal offense with the uh, current constitution i suspect there is but i have a lot of lawyer friends um that are lawyers in pakistan attorneys in pakistan that are actually examining the law and mm-hmm. uh they feel it's only like technically it's it's not like it's there it it's there but it's not like mm-hmm. as legible as you might think so there's ways around it and they can actually to quote unquote fix it uh they yeah, i yeah. feel like they're optimistic but you know they know what they're talking about they're legal analysts i'm not apostasy is defined as the abandonment of a religious or political belief in this case apostasy would mean leaving islam according to a legal report in the library of congress they conducted a survey of countries that expressly made apostasy a capital offense meaning punishable by death and those countries that are listed as Afghanistan, Brunei, Mauritania, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, UAE, and Yemen. However, the report describes only a small number of cases showing the application of these capital punishment laws were identified. Of the country's research, it appears that Iran is the only one that has executed a person convicted of apostasy to date. Specifically about Pakistan, it mentions there is no statutory law that criminalizes apostasy in Pakistan. In 2007, a bill to impose a death penalty for apostasy for males and life imprisonment for females was proposed in parliament but failed to pass. Quote, although no examples of anyone actually being criminally prosecuted of apostasy were found, conversion is not without consequence. It has been reported that if a married Muslim couple converts to another religion, the couple's children become illegitimate and may become wards of the state. Converts from Islam and atheists may also be vulnerable to Pakistan's blasphemy laws. This episode is to be continued. In part 1 which we just completed, we learned about Ali's life story. In part 2, we ask him more specific questions about his beliefs, about his rationality, his morality, and other common questions that he gets asked. Tune into the next episode for part 2. We'll see you next time. Thank you.